this? It's on like Donkey Kong. Hey. <laughs> I resemble that remark. Alright, let's kick this off then. Good. Sure, yeah. You're good. Sure, yeah. Alright. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Northworld Library. Tonight's presentation of The Mummy in the Monkey Live, the fourth program in our annual Hauntober series. I'm thrilled to have these guys here tonight. Before we start, I have a couple housekeeping notes I want to pass along. Uh, first, a big thank you to the Friends of Library for underwriting tonight's event. Uh, and most of our October events this year, we appreciate their feedback, or their uh, assistance, I should say. Uh, second, please note there's some evaluations on the chairs and also on the side. If you don't mind taking a moment to fill them out, let us know how much you enjoyed tonight's program. We do appreciate your feedback. Uh, next, it's a courtesy of both our presenters and your fellow audience members. If you have a cell phone, if you don't mind putting it on vibrate for the next hour, we appreciate it. Uh, and then lastly, just a quick commercial, only one, for our, our final uh, program coming up, uh, Hot Sober Celebration comes to a close this Wednesday, October 24th, when PD columnist and author of, oh, I forgot my props, and author of uh, The Bedside Bats of Armchair Companion Dracula, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, Mark Dogziak will be here to give his vampire talk. Uh, he's, he's done it before, it's, it's kind of an encore presentation. Uh, he's also bringing personal items from his own collection, including things from Dracula's Crypt. So. How can you miss that, right? Uh, which brings us back. Oh, uh, other fall programs including uh, Bighorn, Social Security, PowerPoint, uh, and more. Register online through phone or talk to us at the events. We're happy to help. Uh, which brings us back to tonight. Uh, Jan Decay and Grim Dory are hosts of the popular online website, The Mummy and the Monkey, influenced by local greats like Goulardi, Superhost, Big Chuck and Little John, as well as nationally syndicated shows such as Elvira, Mystery Science Theater 3000. They are dedicated to delivering the unique comedy skits and cheesy B-movies that you need and deserve. Um, tonight, they're going to take a look back at the history of horror hosting in Cleveland, uh, as well as what they do in the future of the medium. Let me see if I get this right. Uh, from the Mistake on the Lake and the Land of the Burning River, you are watching To Mummy and the Monkey. Hey! Thank you so Sounds great, sounds great. Well, thanks again for coming out tonight. Happy Halloween, everybody. Yeah, a little bit uh, premature, but you know what? It's coming up right around the corner, so I just wanted to get that in tape. All right, so now we've got tricks and treats for you. We have a nice little presentation. It's going to be about an hour or so, uh, maybe three or four hours. Uh, so get ready. Hope you brought something you need. Bathroom's down the hall. Just kidding. No, it's about an hour. Uh, we got, uh, hopefully, uh, it'll go by nice and fast and be fun. We're going to show some bits and skits and some footage from horror hosts that you might know and some that you don't know that are local and otherwise. So. Um, let's get this presentation started off, okay? With some introductions. With some introductions. Yeah. Alright, well I'm Jenny Decay, the Mummy. And I'm Grim Gory, the Monkey. And together we host, The, the Mummy, Mummy and, and the, the Monkey's Scary Scary Hangout. Tell them a little bit about that. Alright, well we have a live streaming show on Facebook Friday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. We play a cheesy movie, movie. Sometimes Monkey Man will cut in funny sound effects. We play comedy skits that um, were inspired by Big Chuck and Little John and those late night legends that we grew up watching. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's interactive. It's the first, as far as I know, horror hosted show around here that's interactive where people can chat, make fun of the movie, they can ask us questions, we do birthday shout outs and read fan letters. That's right, and uh, we're going to get more into that in a little bit, but first let's go way, way back, everybody, where it all started. Tell you where the whole horror hosted thing got kicked off. Now, horror hosting is pretty much uh, American as uh, apple pie, all right? Harold Schwarzenegger. But, <laughs> what? He was a governor, right? I mean, he just, hey. So, um, I didn't like that. <laughs> anyway, so it started that pretty much in around the mid 1950s, around 1954, 55, when? All right, so what started horror hosts in the United States, Screen Gems would sell to these different networks all over the country. Um, film packages. And so Screen Gems had um, a shock theater package that they would sell to different markets. And they would encourage the local TV stations to have someone host the movie. And at that time they were considered their goriest or their scariest films. Now we see them as you know really cheesy movies compared to what's on TV and in movies nowadays. But at the time, they thought, well, if we can have a host kind of get you through it so it's not so scary and kind of walk you through the movie, 
it would add a little comedy and entertainment to a uh, creepy or a scary film. That's right, and that's for tonight's title, for tonight's, uh, I'll call it like a TED Talk. This is more like a dead talk, right? <laughs> um, uh, nothing to fear, because it uh, insinuates that these hosts were created to uh, make sure that, like the Jenna was saying, you don't feel so scared watching Frankenstein, Dracula, or the thing that came from beneath the couch, whatever bad movie they were showing that night. So, uh, the first one of the, one of the first iconic, I mean, they weren't local, but the iconic horror host was one named Vampira, portrayed by Myla Nerman. Uh, in, up in Los Angeles, California. And this all happened around 1955. And she inspired uh, another one that you all probably have heard of, Elvira, right? Mistress of the Dark. Everyone's heard of her. Well, we're going to show you a little bit of uh, Myla Nermi as Vampira, as she was. So, here, take that. Okay. And that will get the party started with the vampire. Hopefully, it's all we're good at. And she. There's a little pause between these things, so. Pete 
Myers, the Mad Daddy, on the radio. Nope. Saturday flight from the Tower of Power, the very top story in my waiting ready, booby ready, rocking laboratory, where we're bending every effort and making every test to be sure that our records are always the best. You see, well, before we play them on this crazy baby air, we dip them in this smoking bath. With extra special care, wearing thick big rubber gloves and using special tongs, we make the Mad Dad acid jazz all the up and coming songs. So you hear a little, a little bit about uh, how he went by his little DJ thing, rhyming everything. The guy was really that fast and super clever. Uh, he uh, didn't do, he did his thing in, in Cleveland radio for a while. After that, didn't take off, and uh, went to New York and didn't really do that well. And we won't get into what happened to him, but it wasn't a pretty ending for the guy. But we just got to keep this thing cheery, and uh, <laughs> and we're gonna keep on moving on with uh, the next eventual ones. Now, there's a fellow that came around. His name is Ernie Anderson. He is a Bostonian originally. And I think a lot of people out here probably recognize that name, right? Well, uh, he was a, uh, a uh, radio announcer for WJW in, in, in Cleveland. And worked booth for, announcer. Yeah, booth announcer. And uh, you want to take over some of this? Yeah, he started on a Channel 3 for a little bit, but then was hired by TV8 WJW as a booth announcer. Um, then shortly after that, they got the film package for Shock Theater, and he was on contract, so they used him as a host. Well, now you got to fast forward to 1963. So from 1958 to 1963, Cleveland had Cleveland had no horror host. Uh, again, like for whatever reason, it just wasn't taken off. But around the rest of the country, there's all kinds of them. Uh, 1963, WJW comes through and uh, picks up or creates a character for him, where he creates a character, Goulart. It was actually originally named Goulardio. He dropped the O and went with Goulardi and came up with a shtick that's, uh, that only ran for three years in Cleveland, but's been remembered ever since. Uh, it, it, his show ran from 1963 to 1966. And 50 years later, people still remember him. They still attend Goulardi Fest every year, that big Chuck Little John Houlihan. We were just there last week together. And we were just there last weekend. That's yeah. right. So it, it's cool that uh, all this time has passed and people still remember it, they still love it, and even if they don't remember Goulardi, they still appreciate the history. Right, so how many people out there remember Goulardi that actually watched it back in the day? Look at that. That's awesome. I often tell people, you know what, if I ever invented a time machine or got a hold of one, I wouldn't do anything really that good with it. I would, I would go back with a VCR, a bunch of videotapes, and tape all that cool stuff that just never got archived. Now, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, only about 18 to 20 minutes of collected uh, footage of Goulardi exists that survives from those three years. That's it. Uh, they didn't archive things back then for whatever reason. And uh, if you watch stuff about Ernie Anderson, interviews with him, he didn't really think that was a big thing. The Goulardi world to him was just another gig. Uh, and he went on eventually to become the voice of ABC, as many of you know. He did the, uh, the love boat and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he actually went out and became a millionaire uh, very quickly uh, under the tutelage of Tim Conway, another Clevelander. Now they went out there and uh, and Ernie had a good time out there and just never understood the popularity of Goulardi. And I don't think any of that really came back until the early, the late nineties when Chuck and John started up the Goulardi Fest. And they went out and interviewed him, and uh, he just was really perplexed by the, the the fact that anybody even cared about that character. But it's the one thing that he did, especially in this time. And he will always be remembered by, by face and by character. So we have a little piece of Goulardi stuff we're going to show you here. Now this is an excerpt from a film that came out in 2006. It's a, it's a documentary about horror hosting in, in America called American Scary. If you have not seen this film, I highly recommend you try to find a copy or look it up online somewhere. It was on Netflix for a while, but I don't think it's on there anymore. But uh, check out this clip from American Scary. Maybe. <laughs> they took Tim and left Ernie. So when Tim left, the station wanted a horror host. They were just these horrible, horrible, horrible movies. So Ernie was perfect for that because uh, <laughs> you didn't really have to say anything nice about him. He would say, this thing really stinks, and I hope you stay tuned. And people did. <laughs> so he took uh, the guise of Goulardio. That was a contest, and the name Goulardio was the winner. Well, he dropped the O and just called himself Goulardi. And 1963, a Cleveland legend was born. My man! 
This is Bro Dad Go to Hot Hot. Made fun of people. Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland's a very hard city to make fun of. You know, it's, it's not a city that you can make fun of. Although the river did catch on fire here in Cleveland and burned for three days, which is kind of unusual. They were putting water on it for the first couple of days. And it's, hey, it's not working. When he put this little goatee on and he could hide behind there and say things that he could not say when he had his three piece suit on, he just didn't care. Go out and put nothing but book. See, what you're doing, book, you get a girl and you book her. And then it just exploded. I mean, he just became Mr. Cleveland. I mean, he could fill practically the Cleveland Stadium, you know, for a benefit of the softball game or whatever. So he uh, did a lot of good for Cleveland. Uh, made a lot of fun with people, but of course, as I say, that's kind of thing. That's the only way to do it, you do something, do it. He had uh, an edge to him. He was tongue-in-cheek, and you always knew that he was ready to bust out laughing. Ernie Anderson, God bless him. The man, he kind of stuck into my heart because of all the slapstick and all the straightforward sort of hip generation, you know. Go, go on back, dude. How's that? How's that? What does that mean? I haven't figured that one yet. Larry was just very uh, sarcastic and caustic and honest. I mean, the honesty of the thing, I think, was probably uh, the fact that I was willing to cut some idols down a little bit. It's the first time you saw a host anywhere go, man, this show's a turkey tonight, dang. You got something better to do? I urge you to do it. I'm going to sit around and watch this garbage, even if they paid me. And they are paying me! <laughs> there in the middle of life, like so many clear those who enjoy Channel 8 science fiction movies. Can you believe there's somebody that enjoys those movies? I think probably it was a sensation because it was probably the first time in the history of television, I mean in television, that somebody came on and was honest and said, this is probably the worst movie I've ever seen, but it's all we got tonight, so it's it. I said, I tell you, when I was a cop, I don't shoot these movies out without the safety glasses on. The <laughs> police maintain to this day that the crime rate every Friday night at 11.30 would go down drastically because people were watching the learning. They wanted to be on every night. It was actually ridiculous. They said it. Everybody watched their beginning in the film. Hey, hey, bro! I was going fun out there. He thought it was a great venue to say what he really wanted to say and hide behind that goatee. Because being in the business, he had to wear the three-piece suit and he had to cater to the sponsors. But Ernie would tell you, if you asked him, what do you think, or he'd tell you, if he didn't like it, he would tell you this. Yeah, so there's a little bit on Ernie Anderson Goulardi, who ruled Cleveland. He was the king of Cleveland from 63 to 66. Of the late night waves. And they also had him uh, actually post like some kids' shows. It was a Laurel Hardy and Gulardi, um, some Outer Limits episodes, I'm, I'm told that he, uh, he posted. They really, really milked his fame. But uh, like he, like a, you know, he had other ideas. He wanted to do more. And uh, he and management really didn't get along too well. He was also one of the first horror hosts to actually have branded merchandise. He had t shirts, sweatshirts, these manners, big boy mugs. That's an actual mug with a, with a uh, clear bottom to it. Oh, the bottoms? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yep. That cost a pretty penny. <laughs> a lot of pennies. But yeah, so and some of the stuff does exist still, but yeah, he was uh, a very interesting fella, and uh, we're so glad to think that we had him, and he's kind of responsible for what you see in the Pierce Park, so. Anyway, moving on. So we go from 1966. Now Cleveland doesn't have a horror host anymore, right? And uh, but when he left, and he was at the height of his popularity, it wasn't like the show burned out. He was burned out of doing the show. So uh, after he left to California, WJW uh, was really scratching their heads on what to do next. How do we fill this gap? So they held some auditions, and uh, a fellow named Chuck Shadowski, who was just Ernie's, uh, well, not just because he did a lot of cool pioneering uh, special effects stuff, because they would put Ernie in the movies sometimes. Uh, things like that, and uh, Chuck was more of an engineer and that kind of guy, but uh, Chuck Chidowski uh, helped out a fellow named Bob Houlihan Wells, and uh, Houlihan tells a story about how a lot of people uh, came to an audition dressed like Ernie, trying to do that imitation of Goulardi, didn't really work out that well, and uh, Bob and, uh, asked Chuck to help him write some stuff and do some skits with them, and uh, they decided to hire both of them, 
And since Bob was the, the, the more well-known one, they called it Houlihan and Big Chuck. So in 1966, like I said, they didn't waste any time. Uh, the Houlihan and Big Chuck show premiered. Anyway. Do we have video on that as well? Yeah, do you want to okay. get the lights? Yes. Okay. So we'll show you a little bit of the Houlihan and Big Chuck show. Oh, I should have just did this. So here they are. Look at those two. And they're prime. Look at those two, right? Yeah, that show ran from... Hello there. And welcome to Wings by Robert. <laughs> Hi, fellow swingers. Welcome once again to Wings by Robert. I'm Robert. This is my jazz ukulele playing accompanist, Carlos. <laughs> You're such a joker. For just a moment there, I thought it was our director, Tony Lawley. Greeting <laughs> 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 today comes in from little Marilyn Zelensky of Cleveland. Thanks, Mayor. One bright and sunny day on the beautiful shores of Lake Erie. <laughs> That's what it says. He was so sure of Lake Erie. Well, one day, a man from a certain ethnic background and his buddy were walking along the shore when a seagull flew overhead. Oh, and you guessed it. Splat! Right on the man from a certain ethnic background's new shirt. Ugh. Oh, man, cried his buddy. Stay here. I'll run and get some toilet paper. Oh, forget it, said the man from a certain ethnic background. He's probably miles away by now. <laughs> Too bad cows don't fly. Oh,
Well, you get what you pay for. Oh, wow, will that Tarbush ever learn? Maybe we'll listen again next time and find out what we've done the real episode of. Chuck pretty much just took up the, the mantle, picked it up, and kind of ran with it because their show went on from 1966 to 1979 as that in, uh, iteration of the show. Now, um, it was interesting too because uh, there's a lot of stuff in that last video, like you couldn't do anything with pills now because there's, you know, all this, you know, what's going on now in the, uh, the phone booths. I mean, you don't even see those anymore, so it's interesting to see some of that old Cleveland stuff in there. But, um, oh. We should also uh, mention the certain ethnic. Um, you can't really, they don't, you can't really do stuff, so of course Parma had a huge Polish community, they Czechoslovakia was Polish, and, <laughs> yeah, the ski, um, and it, it all started with Mularty, he had the Parma place skits where they would make fun of Parma, you know, the, the pink flamingos, the white socks, the polka music. And um, Big Chuck and Hulahan, and Big Chuck and Little John did that too, and, and instead of calling it, you know, Polish, they would use uh, the certain ethnic term. So they coined that term. I don't think anyone else has ever used that term. Nope. Yeah, Chuck came over that term. So, Hulahan and Big Chuck made tons of skits, made lots of people happy and, and laugh in Cleveland. Uh, anybody here ever get to go on their show, Hulahan, as a kid? You did? No. I was old right to myself. That's pretty cool, yeah. That's, that's really neat. That's something I never got to do. Because, uh, I don't know, maybe it was too hairy or too many fleas. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, yeah, so Hulahan and Big Chuck and then you know, so that's like uh, in the late 60s, uh, some of that stuff went down. But, uh, but then, and, but Cleveland didn't stop there. More stuff started, more, more hosts started popping up. Now there was a station, a UHF station, which I don't even think that stuff's even around anymore. No. Uh, and everyone remembers UHF, and you see that TV right there. The one dial was the, you know, the top dial was the regular, you know, networks, and then the bottom one was the UHF. And, if you, and all of us, you know, that remember these, Used to play around in that seat and pick up stations, you know, outside of Cleveland and so find out cool just stuff. Right. But yeah, the rabbit ears, you know, aluminum foil on them, whatever you had to do. Wrap wet pierogi around it, whatever. <laughs> Get the reception. But anyway, so yeah, but uh, WUAB uh, also wanted to enter the game, so uh, they hit up their local, I wrote their, their resident. I should say, it was like a newsman. He was Martin, a newsman Sullivan. Or Marty Sullivan. Martin Sullivan was asked uh, to uh, come up with a character. And he came up with Superhost, who you saw at the end of the skit there. Now, uh, Superhost show actually ran from 1969 to 1989. He had a 20-year run here in Cleveland. That's pretty good. Now, everybody remembers how special. Now, that was a Saturday afternoon show. That was a four-hour commitment. Remember that? You'd wake up, and you'd watch all your cartoons or whatever. And then around noon, Soup's on. He would come on, and he would show. Let the video explain. Okay. What do you to get? Yep. This is something from a little piece we do on our show called TV Time Travel. Where I uh, go and look at old TV guides and I reconstruct uh, using visuals what was shown on Big Chuck's show or Hulahan or Little John and, uh, or, and, uh, and then go to Saturday and what was shown on uh, Saturday on Super Hope Show that, uh, that weekend. So here's an example of what you would see Saturdays while Super Hope's ruled the airwaves then. On Channel 4, these are really good. Let's do this. Fuck! It's a bird! No, it's Super Hulk! This is a show! Meet Bible Manor director Brady Henry Bookerstein becomes Super Hulk! And with powers far beyond those of ordinary men, Super Hulk brings you Saturday afternoon. And now, Sue's on! So coming up here as an example, which you see, so at noon, they show three stooges that they would do maybe a half hour of Laurel and Hardy, and then you have two movies in the afternoon that might be something like Attack of the Puppet People. Oh, there's a bunch of good, bad people. She showed a lot of Godzilla stuff on this show, too. And then you might have a second movie, but like, for example, The Giant Leaf, remember that bad movie? But yeah, that's kind of an example of what an afternoon with Superhost was like, and those are great. 
Uh, it's another show that uh, there's only about in the trading community because uh, a, lot of, a lot of episodes exist actually from um, Big Chuck and Little John, but very few of uh, super hosts are out there that people trade, uh, and very even more few of Houlihan and Big Chuck. But anyway, so that's super host Mark Sullivan, who is still alive. He's reti he retired whenever a show went off the air in the early 90s. He lives in Oregon, and they were going to try to get him down for this last Rurati Fest, but he doesn't travel so well. He's in his 80s. But uh, Martin can, is still on Facebook. If you want to look him up, he feel friend you, and he actually will correspond with people from time to time. Yeah, he doesn't answer uh, fan mail if you send him a message. What is next? So let's see who's next. Oh. Can't forget anybody. Oh, we, we're not. We've still got a lot to go here. As far as hosting. Who do we yeah. have next group? Oh, we can't forget this guy, right? Everyone, he is the mad prince, I call him. Come on. It's the one known as the predecessor. The guy, or the guy that came after the ghoul. Or Goulardi, it was the ghoul. A fellow named Ron Sweeney, at 15 years old, went to one of Goulardi's appearances at Euclid Beach Park, uh, dressed as a, in a full gorilla costume, jumped on stage and did some stuff, totally amused Ernie Anderson, and he thought the kid was you know, kind of neat, so he said, hey, why don't you come down and you kind of go for for me and do things for, for, for me around the show. So Ron Sweet did. He was a little bit of a protege. And uh, after Goulardi left, you know, a little bit after, a few years after, he said, uh, you know what, I'd like to do the Goulardi shtick. And uh, Ernie Anderson was like, you know what, I, they own the name, I own the character. You can, you know, dress up like me, but call yourself something like, I don't know, the ghoul. And uh, Ron Sweet did. So from 1970, no, 71, he started the Ghoul Show on, I think it was Kaiser Broadcasting. It might have been 61 back then. But uh, yeah, he was on from about 71 to 75, then went to Detroit. This guy was kind of transient between Cleveland and Detroit for a while. He also had his show syndicated in different parts of the country, like Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Pittsburgh, like all these, all these different cities, but it seemed like he was the most popular in Cleveland and Detroit. So yeah, he was back and forth between the, the Channels. You ready to hit that? Uh, those lights. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So he. Uh, so but yeah. So between Cleveland and Detroit, the guy came back from '71, '75, went to Detroit. He came back in the '80s onto Channel uh, 61, WLCLP or something like that. And then uh, left for a while and came back in the '90s to WBNX Channel 55. So uh, here is a really fun clip. It's a Halloween-related one. Of the way the ghoul carves a pumpkin. Check this out. And I think you can all kind of figure out how to do it. Clean 
name that out. Well, you just run over to the hallway closet over there, okay, and you pull out the vacuum cleaner. Right, they get the vacuum cleaner, you know, ah, suck it, 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 suck that is the long, the elongated way to do it. The ghoul has his own special way of cleaning out the jack-o'-lantern. Well, you're probably sitting there going, how's that, ghoul? What easier way is there to clean it out other than using the vacuum cleaner? Well, here at Ghoul Power Land, we have what we call Boom Booms! That's right! So if you really want to clean it out zippy, zippy, zingy, zingy fast, all you do is take one of these boom booms, light it, throw it in, and there you go! As I will demonstrate here. On the corrector, I like this and throw it in. I'm getting out of here like a bat out of karma. You ain't gonna believe it so far. If you're ready, the ghoul's ready. And I'm getting out of here. I'll tell you, gang. You ain't gonna believe. Wait a second, now. Whoa, it's lit! Ah! I'm getting out of here again! Yes, a little taste of Ron Sweet there, the ghoul. How many people remember watching that guy growing up? Yeah? He was insane. He actually, like, uh, like Spinal Tap, he took the, the Goulart and stick and turned it up to 11. Right? He, you know, the fray wig, the, the phony beard and mustache, the lab coat, but man, that guy was off the hook. And he's still kind of wild like that. He still does stuff. Uh, he'll pop up around uh, Halloween time, but mostly does stuff in Detroit, you know, venues out there, Halloween parties. He's done a few appearances here in Cleveland. A few years ago, we uh, attended a ghoul art tribute show, and it was at a record shop on West 14th. And I saw a picture of him on Facebook. He was at Franklin's Castle. There was some sort of shindig a couple weekends ago. Uh, he wound up there, but uh, yeah, that's Ron Sweet, man. And uh, like, he's still around, does his own thing, and uh, who knows where he'll pop up next, and who knows where he'll blow up next. I don't know. <laughs> that's more I all right? So onward and upward to uh, the, the late 70s again, the ghouls kind of out in and out of Cleveland, Houlihan and Big Chuck is going strong, but fate intercedes and people want to change their things, and, and the Houlihan, Bob Wells decides to part ways with the Houlihan and Big Chuck show. Uh, he got an offer from a, a Christian broadcasting station out in um, Florida, Clearwater, Florida area, and decided uh, to take that job, I believe it was a general manager, manager job. And uh, he did that, so, uh, that opened up uh, a spot for somebody, and um, hmm, who was around that wanted to do that? I'm not really sure exactly who asked who, but uh, but Big Chuck made arrangements with a, a guy named John Rinaldi, also known as Little John. And uh, wow, and 79 to 2007, that show, that show was on. They did a over 40 some year stint as a show, right? It was 47 years they were on the air. They, they still have a half hour clip show on Channel 8 late night on Sundays. Sunday around 11.30 or... or yeah, I think 11.30 or whenever football ends, but... Yeah, that's the right time. They have over 2,000 skits, and a lot of them Big Chuck wrote, and it's incredible. 2,000 skits. Yeah. So we're going to show you a little taste of, uh, Big, Ch of the, the Big Chuck and Little John show, the new one, that... Uh, with a lot though from the Ooh, and a big chuck uh, thing, so let's get that one now. Yeah. 
you have any letters? Uh, yes, sir. I have some very fine letters. Uh, 30, 35 cents a head. Okay. I want a half a head. A half a head of letters? Yeah. A half a head, not a whole head? A half a head of letters. Now, hold on a second. I'll be right back. Hey, Chuck. Yeah. Got a big knife? A big knife? What for? Oh, some big, dumb, ugly looking jerk wants a half a head of lettuce. Do you believe that? <laughs> and this fine gentleman would like the other half. <laughs> Yeah, and he has that, the, uh, the iconic laugh at the end of their skits, which uh, actually Chuck took uh, from a radio announcer back in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, he just thought the laugh was funny and kind of just used it at the end of skits and it stuck. And if you, if you ever watch Sven, Sven Gulli out there, anyone ever see that guy out of Chicago, you'll hear that laugh pop up sometimes. And it, it takes you aback if you're a clean, you're like, hey, wait a minute. That, that's our, you know, Big Chuck Little John's laugh, you know, or whatever. But uh, now the, the guy that portrayed the first, uh, you know, uh, version of Sven Gulli actually was around in Cleveland at the time. I think he just kind of borrowed some stuff. There's actually other few sound effects that pop up uh, from those days on the Sven Gulli show. And uh, that's, that's a good show, too. I, I like that one. It's kind of fun. Very well produced. So, uh, so Big Chuck and Little John are on the scene, right? They're doing no, no wrong. Everyone's, you know, loves these guys, they're up and about, and like you said, a lot of people have seen them in person, right? They would do personal appearances and things like that. Uh, really fun guys, and uh, they, I think they were on, or close to, uh, what, what, do the math, what is uh, 79 to 2007? I think it was like 47 years. Not that, that's not 47 years, it's 79 and now. Oh no. Well, their last show was what, 2007? Yeah, so whatever that is, they were on that one. And they're still going. Like I said, they, they've been to every Pilates Fest. They're part, pretty much co-hosts of the whole show. We see them set up. They do their own thing. These guys are incredible. Uh, personal story, uh, I was at a Pilates Fest one year, and uh, Chuck had uh, some, I believe they kidney stones removed. And he was out, uh, most, he was there Friday night. He, had some, he went to the hospital either Friday night or Saturday morning, but came uh, later on on a Saturday, holding a, a side, he had his hospital bag in his hand, and he came to sign autographs for people. The guy is a stalwart. He's just an insane guy who loves his fans, and they, they do appreciate what they have here in Cleveland. They love it, and they'll, they said they'll never leave. I interviewed Big Chuck and Little John a few years ago at the Party Fest, and I asked Little John, I said, when are you going to stop doing this? Is there ever a time to stop? And Little John's response was, when they throw the dirt on us, when they throw the dirt on us, that's when I'm going to stop. So Chuck's 85, shows no signs of stopping. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to go to Blarney Fest, if you haven't been, you got to go. It's usually, what, October of, of, you know, next year? Yeah, usually it's mid-October. Yeah. This year it was the 12th through the 14th at the uh, Berea Fairgrounds. Right. And I believe it will be the same location next year, but they updated on their webpage and on the Facebook group. Right. So now we are going to move to some other horror hosts around the Northeast Ohio and surrounding areas, but all Ohioans, uh, that you may not have heard of or you may have, I don't know. So you want to hit them lights and I'll hit this beautiful sure. B-roll footage. And we'll narrate this as we go. It's a quick one, so. Okay. Yeah. But get ready to run back over there. <laughs> you gotta get your steps in here. Yeah, yeah. Alright, here we go. You can do this. Okay. Okay, that is Dr. Green. He was on uh, TV in the 80s and 90s. Oh, and there's Baron von Wolfstein with Fritz the Night Owl from Columbus, Ohio. There's the cool ghoul. That is a ghastly ghoul who's a current host in Dayton, Ohio on cable TV. And then the son of ghoul who's still on TV in Akron. Frank and Jack, they were on WOIO in 1987. So yeah, those are the other hosts in Ohio. So it's not just Cleveland. Okay. There were a ton of them in Ohio. And I should flip the lights back on, right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I think I paused this thing. I don't know what it But yeah, so that's a really quick uh, recap of some of the other horror hosts around the Ohio area. Anybody hear of any of those other ones that we just showed? Who? Sorry. Son of Ghoul. Son of Ghoul, yeah. Now the story of the Son of Ghoul it was, is portrayed by a fellow named Kevin Scarpino, who entered a, a look-alike contest probably in the, in the mid-80s, I believe it was. A ghoul, the ghoul had a look-alike contest at a Halloween party, uh, and Kevin entered, there was a bunch of guys jumping around the stage dressed like, you know, the overcoats, big beard, mustache, and the front waves, and um, Kevin won the, uh, won, won the, uh, the contest, and 
it, there's videotape of it, and you hear a uh, sponsor from Google go, I give you son of Google. So I think uh, Kevin just took that brand with it, uh, kind of knew some people in the business, got himself a show. Actually, he took over for the Cool Google, correct? Uh, right, on Channel 16, it's now Retro TV, but the Cool Google <laughs> used to be on TV and after and on those UHF stations, you had to wiggle the right ears just right. Some, some cities didn't even get it. Um, but yeah, um, Son of Gould took over. Or as Shepard would say, they saw it, but they didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so Son of Gould took over, and he's still on TV. He's been on TV out there for 32 years. He's on Channel 16 Retro TV on, uh, I believe, Saturday nights. That's right. He's also mentioned in the article that's, uh, that Pressure Life put out this uh, this Halloween that we we're on the cover of. Oh, uh, that's right. <laughs> it's a, actually a very well written article and uh, a lot of fun. And glad to be a part of that. So now we are moving into the final stretch here, folks. That's right. We got the other horror host, and now we're going to go into. Oh my gosh, who do we go to next? I don't know. Well, it's interesting because after Big Chuck and Little John, you know, they retired in 2007. There have been other horror hosts that have cropped up in the Cleveland area, but not on television. It seems like terrestrial TV sort of gave up on the concept of having a movie host or a horror host, except for the rare ones like Sven Gulli or, or Elvira, you know, who, who established themselves in the 80s. But uh, locally in Cleveland, it was sort of a low, you know, on television, per se. So, uh, but to us, that kind of meant just, hey, there's an opening there, right? What, as you always say, what it was what was old could be cool again, right? Oh, I'm sorry, did I steal your line? You did. What's your line? You say <laughs> Pretend you didn't hear that. What's old can be cool again. But, but with a lot of the, the syndicated stations, they'd rather sell the time for infomercials late at night and time, or, or have the time leased, right? Yeah. Then invest in local programming. Now, there is Sven Cooley, but he's from Chicago, he's syndicated. There are other cities that are bringing it back, like Midnight Mausoleum, they're on TV in Iowa on Fox 8 out there. There's Dr. Paul Bearer, who's on Channel 55 in Florida, um, the WB. And um, there's a lot of streaming online hosts now with the way technology is changing, and that's why we brought this um, display here. So it all started with radio in the 40s, all those radio broadcast, or the radio shows. Everyone's huddled around the radio, late night listening to The Shadow, or you know, whatever's on that, that night, and then you move over to the invention of television. To TV. And, and before you could DVR it, or stream it on Netflix, or go get the tape from Blockbuster back in the day, you would sit around this little TV and, and watch your favorite programs. But or now, miss them forever, that's right. Yeah. But now, you can watch anything on your computer, your phone, anything that has streaming. So we're taking advantage of this new platform, just like other people in the past took advantage of TV, and it was a whole new thing, you know, back then when Gulardi was on. That's right, so about 2014, Janet and I decided to throw our front wing into the ring and become horror hosts ourselves. Because, well, why not? Yeah. Now, we woke up one day and said, hey, let's be horror hosts, right? Yeah, pretty much. That's exactly how it happened. <laughs> But if, if it's only because of the love we had for the genre. I grew up watching all these guys except for Hulardi. I, I wish I went back that far, but I did get to see Hulahan and Big Chuck and Big Chuck and Little John, all those guys. The cool, everything else you've seen, Superhost up here. Um, and I've always kind of had a passion for this thing. I just kind of like the schlockiness of it. And the way that Chuck and John, and it's no uh, disparagement to them, but the way they did things, it just seemed like anyone could do it. It just seemed like they got a camera and they just... You know, something, I can tell the editing's a little kind of off, but it didn't matter. They did something, and it just came off genuine, you know? It didn't seem overproduced. There was a certain charm to it. A lot of their signs were hand-drawn by local artists. Um, posters and, and flyers that were all hand-drawn. All their props were like, you could tell they were just handmade. It wasn't like some Hollywood special effects thing. Yeah, and that would have just made it too polished and, and maybe not that interesting, especially to a, a, a young Grim Gordon. But anyway. Um, so I was inspired by all those guys, and with the uh, invention of first uh, VHS cameras, uh, I started doing a little show for myself, uh, playing around with video editing, and then later on with digital, it just made things so much easier, and then streaming came along, where just about, when it's a good thing and a bad thing, anyone can put a show on, and they do now. If you've been on YouTube or wherever, gosh, there's people opening up boxes that get millions of views, you know? It's crazy. It's just like, hey, I got a new toy, and watch me open this toy up. Why don't you go buy your own toy to open it up? But <laughs> millions of people, and your networks that spend millions of dollars trying to get millions of people to watch their shows, and they're not, but they're watching a kid open up a Kinder egg. I just, it's just really weird. But there you go. 
So uh, it made things easier for people with a dream or idea to just kind of do their own thing. And that's what, we, that's what we've done. That's what started the Mummy the Monkey Show way back in 2014 and then to 2015 is when we started the actual show. Yes, originally before that, we met on, it was a public access cable show in Cleveland, Channel 20, the daughter of the ghoul show. He's actually wearing one of my old shirts. That's a collector's item. If you want to model that for the audience. He's our model, there you go. That's worth about 100,000 yen, which is about 10 American dollars. <laughs> so once that was canceled, we helped with, it was another person's production, and, and I just helped host it, and Monkey Man would help behind the scenes, and he was in some skits. And um, after that was canceled, we decided to try putting our own videos together. That's right. And uh, the one question we get asked the most is, what channel are you on? Well, you know, we tried the whole cable access thing. Again, if you want to get on uh, network television, there's a whole judging process and, and standards and qualities and all this kind of stuff. All kinds of things you have to sort of, you know, and you have to hold your way. If you don't perform, you're gone. With the internet, you have, you know, you can do what you want. And hopefully people will start looking at it as a, a, a a way to, to, to look, watch stuff, okay, that, that's not uh, overproduced or picked just for you to watch. You pick what you want to watch, and uh, I think that's the cool thing about the internet. There's so much stuff, and you get to sit there and choose what you want, and you can watch it. You can hook up your television, stream it to your rectangular box in your living room, so it's kind of like you're watching us on TV, right? Um, but yeah, that, that's all starting to transition, and people are starting to get it that you don't have to be on a network show. And if you are on a network show, if it's not national, if it's local, then you're just in that area, which ain't a bad thing, but, you know. Yeah, and it's not that we're not opposed to television. We are open to TV things. Uh, we are on KOFY TV in San Francisco right now for the month of October um, as a half-hour skit show. Um, so we just love the internet platform. It gives you more freedom, more creative control without being on a contract or answering to someone else's vision of, of your show. And uh, what do you want, Edgar? Uh, if you can only pay the rent, that would be great. Huh? Uh, no, but there are ways. I mean, if you're inventive and you know, you can play around with certain things, there's different avenues you can probably take to learn how to monetize off of uh, something like this. But anyway, we're going to show you the opening for our show, and uh, you'll get to see a skit that. Decay and I are in it, we put together. Again, this is all done by us. We create our own characters, our own costumes. Uh, we write our own scripts, which will be very evident. We edit everything, which will be very evident. But uh, no, we, 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 really, we, really, we really try hard to bring, uh, you know, to, to preserve the genre that inspired us. So here is something from The Mummy and the Monkey. Yeah.
people like Big Chuck and little John Bullhead and Big Chuck started in Cleveland and how we want to continue it, bring it to Cleveland and the world. So here is a little bit of what they did and what we did in homage to that. So here we go. Friday night Facebook show. How long is it? Um, like 10 to 12? 
Yes, it is a uh, about a two-hour show. We usually keep it to 10, 10 to 12. Uh, we show a, a whole movie. It was like usually a public domain type of movie. Uh, we usually insert uh, you know sound effects into it, show bits like that and skits. Uh, and we'll break it up into like four or five segments and come in between and chat with everybody on who's online. Uh, things like that. You want to talk about? Uh, yeah, we'll play skits like the Stasha skit you just saw. Um, he has the TV time travel segment where he'll take old TV guides and he tries to find that date or close to it. And we'll talk a little bit about what the host back in the day would show as well. Yeah, but we mostly you know, chat with the, the people that uh, tune in, you know, so to speak. So it's a lot of fun to interact with people live. I think that's what we're trying to do to differentiate what we do as far as uploading something that's already done that someone can watch whenever. The incentive is, is to tune in while we're live so you can all chat with us. You could always go back and watch it because they do archive it on Facebook and we have some shows on YouTube. But all the live stuff we do now is on Facebook and uh, we just have so much fun doing it. It's a totally different experience for us because actually the audience entertains us during the, the as we're showing the movie because we'll watch the movie as, as the audience does and they're making fun of it and talking with each other and they're cracking us up. Yeah, it's almost like, if you've ever seen a Mystery Science Theater, it's almost like a reverse version of that, where the viewers make fun of the movie along while we watch. <laughs> yes. yes? What is the name of the Facebook page? Oh, that's oh, really good. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> you do it. It's the Mummy and the Monkey. That's what I figured. Yeah. I to and to oh, yeah, on the mummyandthemonkey.com, we do have links to our Facebook, but if you just look up the Mummy and the Monkey, we do have a Facebook group along with a fan page. And I'll post, um, and Monkey Man will post, you know, when we'll be on next. I'll make little events out of it. We've got all kinds of We do have flyers up here, guys. If you guys want to grab flyers, there's a couple magazines left. Um, we also have flyers to other conventions we'll be appearing at. There's one coming up in November called Dark Xmas. They're going to have some Walking Dead actors there. Um, one of the Michael Myers, one of the actors that played Michael Myers would be there. And... Oh, you want to talk about that one, Greg? Well, you can. I'll just hold Okay, that you'll, you'll be the band now. <laughs> January 12th at the Berea Elks Lodge, we're actually going to be hosting a double feature. What were the movies again? Oh, uh, the, the Last Man on Earth, starring Vincent Price, and Man Who Turned to Stone. And this is a family-friendly, like, all-ages event, um, hosted by the, the same people that put together Cinema Wasteland, but we will be um, helping with that. And these movies are going to be shown on 16mm, real to real, like the old school thing. So, you know, all that's going to be going on in the background, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Sir! Uh, a couple, oh, no, that's okay. kind of came on the thing. <laughs> um, the first time. off, 19, that was Big Chuck's Cleveland Crest Boy, the street over. Mm -hmm. And every Halloween, we would get the Big Chuck and Hulan or the Big Chuck and Little John uh, things. And then for the ghoul, we, my buddies and I played, they played Big Chuck and, and Little John at uh, Stable Park Time at 3. So we made signs supporting the ghoul. And we were able to sit in the dugout for the Bulls team and hold our signs up over on TV that night. So oh. that was really awesome. So was, How cool is that? Yeah. He didn't forget one part of that either. I mean, it stays with you, doesn't it? Those yeah. kinds of things. And they mean so much. And they were local. And there's no reason why that can't be recreated. And you can kind of stay local, but then we can reach out to the rest of the world and share it for them. But if we could just be cool with Cleveland, I'd be cool with that. Yes, sir? Is, is there any, you know, is there anybody else doing your own host? Are live streaming like you two are doing? Um, the, the closest one that's doing it, so there there was um, a horror host from Indianapolis called Sammy Terry. Well, Sammy Terry has passed on, but his son will play the old episodes on Facebook like the first Friday of every month. And they get like 30,000 hits a month. It's All the Hoosers love Sammy Terry, and, and they have old videos of him on YouTube too. And he was a cool host. And no, they're not actually, and that's what we think we're sort of on the the cutting edge of as far as doing something different with the horror hosted show is to uh, do it live uh, again with the incentive that you can actually chat live no matter where you are in the world. You know, uh, it's like you're being there. That's why we call it the Harry Scary Hangout because you're hanging out with us and everybody else that's into this same type of thing. And he's scary and his smell, or you're yeah. hairy and your smells are scary. Well, <laughs> This is a family show, so I'm going to be, I'm going to be nice to you. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Well, I'd just like to say, uh, I watched the show when it was on YouTube. I was watching that one where you're knocked off. You know, you got three, oh, we got three. three strikes and you were out. Yeah, that happened live when we were streaming. Yeah, we had a movie we were playing called The Dracula vs. Frankenstein, or also known as Assignment Terror. You want to tell the story? 
Yeah, so with YouTube, even if you're playing a public domain film, there could be someone from like overseas that says, hey, I own 30 seconds of a song from that movie. Or down the street. Or down the street. I mean, and even if it's your own original content, it, you know, public domain aside, you can still get dinged on YouTube. Their algorithms are really glitchy, and I think it's all robots that, that run YouTube. I don't think you can talk to a human being anymore. They're, they're a little bit overprotective, and they just they'll flag anything that anyone claims they own. Yeah. I tell you, the show is actually better on Facebook because of the comedy. It gives it an interactive quality, and and we were doing it live on on, uh, on YouTube. Thank you very much. We were, doing, we were doing it on YouTube live, and it just wasn't the same vibe. Nobody, people weren't figuring out that they could watch it live for some reason. It was a totally different vibe. Mm -hmm. Facebook's definitely more community uh, like. It's almost like you know broadcasting to a, a local audience. The sound effects are, are a tremendous plus too. Those are great. I mean, well, they'll take a terrible movie and make it hilarious. And that was I I, mean, I love doing that anyway, but. Uh, became more apparent as we would upload stuff to YouTube and people I'd say, hey, do you watch our show? And they go, yeah, I just fast forward to the movie. Well, you know, I kind of want, want you to watch the bad movie as part of the experience. So one of the incentives to do that is to put some funny stuff in there so maybe people want to watch just to hear whatever's going to happen. You yeah. play it next as far as the sound effect. Because I get them from all over the place. Yeah. And I was going to say, too, is I was totally shocked because Anita, I took my son to Little John and um, Big Chuck show. Um, at the end, they actually closed the show on my face, and they kept doing that wah wah wah, you know. And by accident, it was like the comedy show too that it got uh, taken over. Mm -hmm. So I heard him call Big Chuck, and I said, "Is there any way that I could get a copy?" You know, it was like only a couple of days, and I was totally shocked. They used him again and again, and he said that was already gone. Yes, he uses oh. the. They just did not keep the tapes. That is, yes, and that's a shame, and that's why we're always looking for people that may have taped it. Uh, anyone out there, if you have any tapes of the show and you taped it, uh, get a hold of us, because we, we like to get some copies of it and trade with other people that uh, collect the shows. There's also, if you guys are interested in, in finding the old Big Chuck and Little John episodes, um, the Big Chuck and Little John Facebook group, there's a gentleman named Jay Summers who has a lot of that stuff on tape, and he'll put it together with the movie, with commercials, and he'll upload them just for the fans to watch, not for resale. Anything, but just to enjoy it and have a little bit of nostalgia. It's on archive.com, right? Um, we'll put them on archive.org. Yeah, yeah archive.org. And what was his name, did you say? Jay Summers. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. share some. If you, if you go on our Facebook page, we'll share some of that, those links from time to time when he posts those because, uh, you know, it's the only way people are going to know is if you just, you know, put, you know let people know. You know? Yeah, and then talking. Sure. Ch change your pace a little bit, but he was with Big Chuck and he, you had on the sweater. Did he recognize that pattern, or was there any conversation? He did. Him and Mulligan actually were like, hey, nice sweater. <laughs> <laughs> and and everyone there was asking where we got this sweater. It's a 1960s Janston vintage wool sweater, but that pattern in particular is hard to find. The, like, the blue and the brown and gray stripes. Um, if you look on eBay or Etsy, they, there are Janston sweaters, but they're different colors and stuff. So yeah. Um, a friend of ours was looking for it for months, found one, didn't care what size it was, he bought it, it was too small for him, so he gave it to me as a Christmas gift. Yeah, and after she got it, uh, it just sort of dawned on us, and Janice said, you should make up a stash, like a stash uh, character or something. Yes, I, I am part Polish, and a lot of times it shows, but... Um, well, I thought, well, let's, they had Stash and Stanley, the certain ethnic character, so let's create a female version, and I decided to call her Stasha, and um, at a flea market, we found that babushka, the little head wrap. Yeah, and about a few years before all that, so it all just kind of came together. And uh, we pined away on whether or not to use the term certain ethnic, because that's something that's very, you know, uh, personal to Chuck's show and everything. So we just thought, we finally came up with from the old country, right? <laughs> to sort of imply all that. But anyway, so we're not trying to directly rip off anything that they did. We would never do that. If anything, it's an homage and uh, just a, a tip of the hat, right? Yeah, or a or a, or a of the sweater. Well, and Goulardi and the Ghoul and Son of Ghoul would wear the glasses with the one lens missing. Okay. They were sunglasses, so I thought, okay, well, what can I do different? And that's why my eye is like this. It's a little tip of the hat to them. A subtle homage. In my own style. The Ghoul sunglasses with one lens missing. Any more questions out there? Yes, sir. Hey, the Ghoul and Son of Ghoul. There was bad blood there, wasn't there? Oh yeah. Did he sue him? Yeah, there was no 
those I weird mean, things that were, even though he, it was just for the contest, the ghoul would just bang up and say, hey, you're son of ghoul, and son of ghoul, or that's Kevin took it and rolled with it, and then the ghoul's very like, hey, man, that's my character, you know, you're ripping me off, blah, blah, blah. And he tried to sue Kevin, but you know, I, I guess it came out that no one can the, the word ghoul, right? It's not a <coughs> trademarkable word. No, the word ghoul is like the word ghosts. So, I mean, it was something that they just couldn't... And he has a different makeup. You know, he has the top hat, and he's still at the phone. But you can't trademark just a big... So he'd switch it up with those weird glasses, and then the top hat, a cape or something. Yeah, he changed it just enough where they, they couldn't... They, yeah, he couldn't sue. Right. But yeah, I, I still think that they're on the outs. So, but you know... But yeah, so anybody else? Have a good time tonight? Yeah. yeah. Well, 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 Very scary hangout that we do now. And uh, if you'd like, you can come up and uh, you know take some of the free stuff that's right here on the bottom here. And we got some Pressure Life magazines left over here, and you can take a look at some of the stuff. If you have any questions or autographs, we can stuff, do pictures and all of that. That's right. But thank you so much for coming, everybody. We really appreciate you. Okay. Don't okay. mention the camera. Here, let it run.